Hello, boys and girls. I'm Pearl of Wisdom, and you're listening to my NHL Pearls of Wisdom. And we I did the Eastern Conference predictions already. Thank you all for listening and following and all of those sort of things like that. I love it. Uh, comments in the comment section that you gave. I always answer you guys down there. Very busy right now, so if I didn't get to your comment, don't worry about it. I'll get there when I find some time because it's playoff season, don't you know? And uh, there's lots of stuff in the land to do. All right, I'm going to do my Western Conference predictions. I had a few people that were like very unhappy with my Eastern Conference predictions and people that weren't as well, but that's just the way it is, right? Uh, one of them I hope I'm incorrect about, that is the Carolina-Boston one. I took Boston, but um, I, as you can tell, always loved Hartford, still a Carolina fan, big Brindamore guy, but... Uh, huge Brindamore guy, actually. One of my favorite players ever, favorite people ever. But I took Boston because it's. I'm looking at it from a practical sense. That being the case, we're going to get into the Western Conference. I got ESPN here. We're going to look at a few things. One thing you'll notice with my predictions, I don't go heavily into regulation stats. I watch a divorce-worthy amount of hockey. And the playoffs are completely completely different bag. Uh, I look through the regular season for teams that are setting themselves up for some strong playoff type hockey. That's where I look at. You can be, we've seen it over and over again, Toronto Maple Leafs getting beat, crush in the regular season, can't do it in the playoffs. The Lightning when they lost to Columbus, I predicted that Columbus would beat the Lightning that year. For this very reason. So that's the way I look at it when I go into it. I'm usually fairly accurate. Let's take a look at the Western Conference first round and who may go where. NHL Pearl of Wisdom Show. Sub yourself up. I do live streams when I feel like it. And you can be part of that too. Lots of fun. All right. First one. Colorado Avalanche versus the Nashville Predators. Now, in the beginning of this series, or beginning of the season, I would say watch out for Nashville, watch out for Nashville, because they were playing playoff-type hockey. The problem was they were turning every game into a war, which might be what they had to do to make it, to tell you the honest truth. The problem, and the problem with that is, is and you're going to say, well, I thought you were looking for people that are setting themselves up for playoff-type hockey. Yes, yeah, setting yourself up. If you notice with teams like Tampa Bay and even Colorado this year, but Tampa Bay in particular, they've learned how to pace themselves through the regular season. There's a lot of times when they play some pretty frustrating-looking hockey. Uh, Pittsburgh Penguins as well. Uh, they, just before break time, they were playing very perimeter, doing things that are pretty much preserving themselves for playing in the playoffs. Um Nashville was turning every game into a war. And that's great coming into the playoffs because that's what you really got to do. And it'll be wonderful for them if they can get the talent to make it in the regular season and then turn it into a war. But trying to make the playoffs like that is draining. And I said that Nashville was likely going to fade down the stretch. And they did. They faded. Uh, they were also playing Soros way too much. I was talking about that, and um, lo and behold, Saros is now injured, and this is really, I mean, I'll go into this a little bit, but like everybody else pretty much out there, I don't know anybody that's even considering the Nashville Predators here. Roman Josie is a beast, so I'm going to look at a possibility that maybe how Nashville can do it, but when you're talking about Valerie Nichushkin, one of the most underrated Two-way wingers in the league this year. Unbelievable. Six foot four, two ten, playing on that line now with McKinnon and Rantanen. I love it. I love it. I mean, I love Landeskog as well. But when they can move Landeskog down and play him with uh Caudry, who also has been, I mean, he had a beastly year this year. We'll see how that translates into the playoffs. But he has that type of game that should translate well into the playoffs. And they picked up Aturi Lekkinen from Montreal, who will is just a 
dune buggy. Uh, that's not the word I'm looking for, but <laughs> dune buggy. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is like a jitterbug everywhere. He, he's that kind of guy. He plays, he grinds everything out, plays in the dirty areas, frustrates you, all those things that I think Colorado will realize that they needed going into the playoffs. So one thing about these uh, this lineup here is it gets a little re small down here in the Burakovsky, Newhook, JT Comfer area. They're not the biggest um, in their third line. Uh, they went out and got Nico Sturm for some size as they identified size could be an issue going into the playoffs. Um, but Kubel and Connor are both on the smaller side. But all of them play amazing two-way hockey. Just about every single forward besides maybe Andre Burakovsky, who's, got, who's that one-shot shooter that you love to have in the playoffs anyways. You won't notice him at all. And next thing you know, he's potting one in the top-hand corner. Um, that they uh, It's such an incredibly balanced lineup. And we don't need to talk about McKinnon and uh, ranting in. I mean, those guys are amazing. Then you've got maybe the best defense in the league, arguably. I mean, I, you can make a case for Tampa Bay as well. But Devon Tays, when they made that trade, if all of you remember, because I know you've all been listening, right? I said that was one of the best trades I've seen in a very long time. And sure enough, he has 57 points in 65 games playing top minutes with Kale McCarr on this team, and he's just a beast. I loved him, I loved him, I loved him. I still love him. Samuel Gerard, one of the best possession player, defensemen in the league, he's healthy now. And then they went out and got Josh Manson to beat people up. It is something that is very important in the playoffs and regular season, a little bit, but nowhere near as much. Uh, it was something that maybe they were lacking a little bit. Um, he's not the greatest two guy anymore defensively or offensively, really. He's about average. But having a guy with size there that can bruise up the opposition is so important. Because this lineup isn't really made up a lot of size. Like McCarr's only 5'11", 187. Gerard doesn't do that sort of thing. Uh, Eric Johnson, he can, but he's really not what he used to be. So getting Manson was excellent. Um, and, of course, Darcy Kemper, in the second half, his numbers went through the roof and started playing fantastic. So this lineup, and now we'll look at Nashville's lineup, where you try to find how Nashville can beat the Colorado Avalanche. And Philip Forsberg's that one-shot shooter I was talking about. He's also a great two-way guy. Um, Michael Granlin, I mean, he's not really a number one center. But he is a very grinding type player, even for a young, for a smaller player. He plays with heart, man. Matt Duchesne's been playing with heart this year. Actually, this whole lineup has been playing with a lot of heart this year. And if they're going to win, you got Tanner Janot, a uh, 24-year-old rookie who has is like a picture of what you want in playoffs, no doubt about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, with Trent in there causing some pain. They might be able to bruise up Colorado to a certain extent. They're going to have to out-heart them, though. Underrated defense, of course, Roman Jos Yossi. He, he probably is going to win the Norris this year. Ekholm is solid. You know, I'd say their defense can almost match up. Alexander Carrier is very underrated. Um, but, you know, Boriecki and Benning getting – a little bit of a drop off there and with Colorado there really isn't a drop off but the biggest thing is here with like I said they played UC Soros to death now he's injured they don't know when he's going to come back and they're going to have to fly with David Riddich and look at his numbers 3.57.883 I don't usually I don't really get into matchups too much in the regular season and all that kind of stuff uh, when you're going into the playoffs because it's just it is like people say it's a totally different game it's not it's cliche but it is totally true it's a totally different game but David Riddich just hasn't done it ever um, he's had some stretches where he was all right but he's gonna you're gonna have to rely on David Riddich to just go off here I don't do this too often 
Uh, I know in Nashville, their home games are, uh, their home arena is very difficult to win in. It is an atmosphere that is just off the charts. But I think Colorado's going to sweep here. I, that's my pick. I'm going to say Colorado to sweep. I think Colorado's been pacing themselves well all year. And uh, not been, like, I think last year they played a much more physical style during the regular season and realized that, you know, there you have to pace yourself. It, winning a cup is a learning experience of pacing yourself through the regular season, finding your spots where you have must-win games and you win them. Uh, that's why you saw Colorado this year, like, lose games to Seattle and stuff like that. They played very perimeter in a lot of these games. It really wasn't sending a message to anybody. And Tampa Bay does that too, if you notice that. So I think they set themselves up well, and I honestly think that, that Colorado believes that they want to get this done quickly so they can have some rest going into the next series. I'm taking Colorado, and I'm taking them in a sweep. I think I'm the only one that I know that is taking them in a sweep, but I'm going to go with it. Uh, Minnesota versus St. Louis. This is like the biggest series. Everybody's talking about this series, Minnesota and St. Louis. And I've gone through this at, for a while. I was on the blues. Uh, just recently, just up until recently, I was a big time on the blues. Um, the regular season record, of course, they were very even. That's why they're in the spots that they're in playing against each other. There, Kaprizov is really the beast of that of, of the whole two teams. And I think, although he doesn't have all that much experience in the playoffs, he plays a type of game. Like, his fire to win is enormous. You notice it in the regular season quite, a, like, all the time. Um, he's got a confidence about him. He's got an air about him. And I look for that when you're talking about winning in the playoffs and being a money player. Um, so we'll look at the roster a little bit. I just talked about Kaprizov. Matt Zuccarello, they rested him, him up to be ready, and that's a smart move. He does have a little bit of playoff experience. Um, the issue, of course, and it always has been with Minnesota, has been up the middle. Ryan Hartman, I love him. He's a playoff-type guy. I'm sure he's going to create fits for St. Louis, but he's not the top-line center that a team that wins the Cup has. I, I don't I can't think of a time when a team won a cup with a centerman top centerman as uh, like Ryan Hartman. It just I don't think it's ever happened. If you think so, go down in the comment section. By the way, sub yourself up, all you fans out there. I do uh, trade videos and free agent videos. I do lots of great stuff that you're gonna love. I'm sure. Uh, Kevin Fiala, I love this. I, I, watch, I think this is a guy to watch out for this year. He, he has been hitting his stride as the season has gone on. And again, one-shot shooters, so important in the NH, in the playoffs to have these guys that when everybody's kind of tired and fallen apart, that he can just go in there, get in the right spot, and hit the top-hand corner. He's that kind of guy. I love him. With Goudreau, Matt, Frederick Goudreau and Matthew Boldy, um, a very young line. Uh, except for Goudreau. Goudreau is young in the sense that he's kind of new to the NHL, but he, he's really crushed it this year. He's really brought it this year. Fast line, good one shooting line, uh, should create fits for St. Louis as well with their speed. Um, I like it. It's a good line. And then this is the one, the most underrated line maybe in the NHL. Greenway, Erickson, Eck, and Polino. I think you can make a case that Erickson Eck is really their number one center. Uh, he's, his two way play is just, is off the charts. Pro probably will have a Selkie somewhere down the road. Maybe. I mean, if he doesn't, he should, um, Jordan Greenway, um, got, has got himself healthy for the playoffs here. Big boy. Uh, that was the other thing I wanted to say about the top two lines are on the small side. Kaprizov is a small guy. Hartman's got lots of heart, but he's not really a big, big boy. And of course, Zuccarello is on the small side, and Fiala. Um, but this line is a beastly line to go up against anybody's top line. And this is going to be their shutdown line. Marcus Foligno is one of the best two-way wingers in the game. 
And Jordan Greenway is getting better and better at that. I love this line. I think this is the line that really could put Minnesota over the edge against uh, St. Louis if they happen to do that. And then going out and getting Nicholas Delorier and Tyson, Tyson Jost, these annoying guys in the playoffs. And, and there is so much to that. Psychological advantage in the playoffs is huge. Yesterday when I did my Eastern Conference stuff, I took the Boston Bruins, and that's one of the reasons. They have guys like Marshawn and even Bergeron that are just give you a psychological advantage. They know how to make you feel low. <laughs> and uh, it sounds weird, but it uh, Corey Perry in Tampa Bay was in Montreal. Look what he did for Montreal that year. Maroon, huge that way. And they went in and got a guy like Deloria who does that same sort of thing. And Tyson Jost has, is becoming that type of player. So, fiery line, going to create a lot of havoc out there. Going to put their put bodies out there and, and try to beat down the opposition. Then they went and got Jacob Middleton, who is that type of player as well. He's burgeoning into one of the better two-way defensemen in the league. When they made the move, I was lukewarm on it. But honestly, ever since I've seen him in Minnesota, I was just plain wrong. He is absolutely fantastic. I love him. Jared Spurgeon, this is a very underrated top four defense. Spurgeon, Middleton, Brodine, and Dumba. I think they have the advantage over St. Louis here in this. And we'll look at St. Louis in a second. I believe that top four is better than St. Louis's top four. It's the bot Merrill and Kulikov. Kulikov has really had a great year this year. And Evison is a fantastic coach. Um, I didn't talk about the coaches in Colorado Nashville series so much because I don't think it really matters so much. But here, I think Evison has, uh, last year when they played Vegas, Minnesota all of a sudden went into a 1-1-3 uh, trap system against Vegas that I didn't see them do all year long. And they did it perfectly. And that's what I love about Everson here. And he's really brought Merrill and Kuligoff probably to the best that they can be levels here now. It's a drop-off, but it's not a terrible drop-off. And then, of course, we get down to, and I just found out right now before doing this video, they're going with Marc-Andre Fleury. And I thought when they got this, this was their chance. This was, this was what they had to do. But he has really not been good leading... Um, I don't worry about regular season too much, but Mark andre Fleury has not looked good. I, I think they're going to give him a shot to put it all together here. And if things falter a little bit, Talbot will be in there in a heartbeat. But if Mark andre Fleury can figure it out with the new defense and everything here and then go off like we've seen him do it before with Vegas when they made the finals and they had no business going there, and of course his time in Pittsburgh, he's a beast. If they do then I'll tell you in a second here. We're going to look at St. Louis first. First of all, St. Louis has something Minnesota doesn't have. That's cups. Sod has a couple. Ryan uh, O'Reilly, Ryan of course, is 1-1 with St. Louis, the, the Blues. Um, Vladimir Tarasenko, Pareko. You know, they have been there before, and that is big. Minnesota hasn't been there. So they they know what how to... Um, they know what it takes. That's what St. Louis has. And they got a great coach as well yeah, in Craig Berube. So I love him as a coach. He's more of a motivator than I think in, in Evison. I like Evison in the sense that maybe his X and O's might be better. But Berube has a way to get the best out of players as well. And he brings his players into combat. Like you're going to, there's going to be a war here for Minnesota. If Minnesota, if St. Louis wins, I think that's how they win. They're going to turn it into an absolute war and bring them down. Look at the size of their players, too. They're big. Sod, 6'1", 206. Riley, 216. Tarasenko, 225. Buchnevich is a big boy. They are uh, uh, that Alexei Topachenko kid. They're keeping him around. He's a little low on the weight size, but he's tall. And that's how they won their cup before. They they just grinded down the opposition. I think that's what they're going to try to do here. They're going to try to physically dominate Minnesota. Um, now, on defense, 
Uh, Marco Scandella, uh, he's more useful in the playoffs, but I don't know in this spot. Colton Pareko got better and better as the year went on, and uh, he has shown it in the playoffs, so I'm not going to put anything past him. He's a big, solid guy that can do damage and uh, get through a seven-round seven series by beating people down. Um, Nick Letty, analytically, Nick Letty is not good. He has looked good in St. Louis, though, and I, I can't put – I haven't looked at the analytics about it, but he's not my favorite. The guy that has been beastly this year has been Justin Falk for him. He's had probably one of his best seasons ever, and he's – got a playoff mentality. Then Tory Krug, Robert Bertuzzo is going to bring the pain. Tory Krug is going to bring that power play presence. Um, but we get down to here, Ville Husso. Ville Husso, who has virtually no playoff experience whatsoever. I can't see them going with Jordan Bennington, who has all the playoff experience and the cup in his pocket, but he's been terrible this year. This is going to be, it's going to be a very close series, I believe. Uh, I, I've been on St. Louis for a while here in this series, but when I, the more I think about it, the more I got to go with Minnesota in seven. Assuming, uh, just simply, like, say Huso doesn't, pan, it, it, they have nobody else to go for. It. Then you got to hope Bennington can create the magic just like that, where Flurry could go off and be the Flurry that we know. And then they get it. And Talbot could go in there, and he's a veteran that was playing really well after Fleury got there. It's like it revitalized him. I think it's going to be goaltending, and that uh, Minnesota ekes it out in a seven-game series. All right, next. Calgary versus the Dallas Stars. Uh I mean, we can look at records if you want. You want to take a look at their record? Uh, Calories definitely had a better regular season. There is some things. Now, I'm going to go from the – in this series, I'm going to go from the perspective of trying to find a way that Dallas does this. And we can look at their points. I mean, Calgary in the regular season has been playing absolutely fantastic possession hockey. They've been able to shut it down when you want. All season long, this team has shown Sutter has been amazing. He should get coach of the year. Um, all season long, this lineup has said to me that they were ready to shut down an opposition if they had to. Not to mention, Sutter makes sure that every single player on his roster are in absolutely top condition. It's the most important part to him to being an athlete and being on his team. So this team is not going to be tired for this at all. Um, there's really not much of a weakness on this team except for the fact that maybe Michael Backlund isn't what you would call a second-line center so much. But he's a great two-way guy, and they have, he's got tons, of, they got tons of speed through the lineup. Matthew Kachuk, to me, is the X factor here, where if you want a guy that is made for the playoffs, that's your guy right there. You got Elias Lindholm, one of the better shutdown centers in the league. Um, on paper, this team is absolutely fantastic. Now, we're going to go to Dallas, and you're going to look on paper and say, yeah, this team doesn't have a chance. Jason Robertson is a beast. I love him, but I mean, he's young at 22 years old. I don't think that's going to matter much in the playoffs here. He's just that kind of guy. Same as Ropo Hints. Rope Hints. I think, you know, he's such a good two way guy that his youth will be and he's big solid i think he's playoff ready all of those sort of things like that joel pavelski has been there before the problem of course is when we get to the jamie ben sagan situation where they didn't have a strong regular season and haven't had it for a while um and then defense you have Suter, who's been uh, there uh has been has a lot of playoff experience miro hishkinen can take over a series he's got that type of talent um, Lindell is that type of player. Now, all of these players, if you look and you compare them to Calgary on paper, Dallas doesn't win this series. Um, here's how Dallas does win this series. Rick Bonus has been preparing this team all year long to play close, 
tight-knit hockey. They have been winning games by one goal. If, you, um, if you've been following them all season long, they're going to be like, they, all, they seem to let people back into the game all the time, um, but they always seem to pull it out. Dallas has a way to pull it out. Not always, always, but enough to actually make the playoffs. I think that if they're going to win, it's because of that. I think Rick Bonus has prepared this team to be able to play tight hockey so they don't get too excited in tough situations and all those sort of things like that. It's what they did when they made it uh, past to the finals of one year. They're going to need absolutely unbelievable goaltending from Jake Ottinger, who has got the talent to give them that, although his age is going to be could be a bit of an issue. And they're going to be having to be blocking a lot of shots. If you remember in those games when they did make it in the bubble, they got outshot a lot. And I think that's what you're going to see here. You're going to see them try to keep the team to the outside as much as possible, get shots to the net, and then look for their chances to counterattack and score goals like they did then. It could happen. I can't see it happening. I think it'll get them one game, and I'm taking Calgary in five. Okay, finally, the Edmonton Oilers versus the LA Kings. And I'm really scared about this. I'm an Oilers fan. I'm scared about this series, to tell you the honest truth. Um, I, I think I would, I don't know, I'd rather them see, see them play in Dallas. Uh Maybe even possibly Minnesota, to tell you the honest truth. Uh, certainly Nashville. Because Edmonton's defense is an issue. It still is an issue. And I know you're going to say, well, they played so well down the stretch um, defensively and all of those sort of things like that. They weren't allowing so many goals. Smith was going off, and he could still go off. No doubt about it. But what they were doing is an offensive pressure system that was extremely hard to maintain in a seven-game series when you're playing as much as you are in the playoffs. The problem, what happens with the Edmonton Oilers is once their speed is taken away, they are in trouble. They, they, they haven't been able to, in the past, find a shutdown ability when the legs go and it's time to shut the team down even though your legs aren't there, the Edmonton Oilers tend to lose. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that you're looking at the defense here. You have Darnell Nurse. Hopefully he's okay. Of course, he's going to play if he's hurt. Um, from my, what I understand, that injury was pretty bad. Um, but how much... How much has he, uh, I can't remember, was it, uh, it was a knee, I believe. Yes, it was a knee injury. Is How much is that already? They're t so going to need Darnell Nurse in here because if Duncan Keith and Kulak have to be the guys in this game, I think LA can win this series. They need Darnell Nurse playing 30 minutes a night. Cody Cece is a pretty average defenseman. He's had a great year in the second half, uh, no doubt about that, ever since the coaching change. But because they've been taking the pressure, forwards have been taking the pressure off of them by playing a high pos offensive possession game in the, in the offensive zone, which you absolutely have to do with this team to win. No doubt about that. The thing is, is it wears down your forwards a lot. And LA is going to try to expose that as much as possible. You got old man Keith. Uh, playing with Evan Bouchard, uh, Evan Bouchard is a star of that combination. I'll tell you that right now. I don't want to see Keith playing too as uh, many minutes as they're probably going to have to play him. Um, and then Brett Kulak and Tyson Berry. I don't like Tyson Berry as a, a, in the in the playoffs. He doesn't play a game that screams playoff hockey to me. So that's I'm going to identify that as the issue with Edmonton that LA is going to try to expose. As far as forwards are concerned, you don't need to worry about McDavid. You don't need to worry about Dreisaitl. Of course, their top six has the ability to pot goals. No doubt about that. But if this defense can be exposed, there could be problems. And that's why you're going to need Mike Smith to be the savior like he was going down the stretch. Mike Smith is a freaking warrior. I've loved him for a long time. 
I'm hoping he's able to hold off at least for this round. But let's for the let's look at LA here and see what I mean. This lineup is young, and this may be the reason why I'm leaning to Edmonton here. As you can tell, I am not like saying, "Oh, this is going to be Edmonton in five. And uh, no, not at all. But um, they're, they're, yeah, they got Athena see you up on that top line. Who did who do they have for injuries here? Uh, Drew Doughty is out, as you know. That that's a, a huge loss here. Um, they're playing Athena see you up there instead of Rasmus Kapari. I don't know if that's going to stay that way, but they're probably going to need his speed against guys like McDavid and all that down the road. No doubt about it. So I get it. Um, Kopitar is you know Cup winner. One of the best two-way centers in the game. Big boy. Knows how to play in the playoffs. And then uh, Adrian Kempe is having a great year. I, we'll see how that translates this year in the playoffs. Trevor Moore is what I call a playoff-type player. Even though he's small, he knows how to get to the spots. He knows how to annoy the opposition. He knows how to bring it when everybody's tired. That's what I love about Trevor Moore. He doesn't seem to tire. And Philip Dano this year, to me, is the X factor here. Philip Dano and Andre Kopitar going up against Dreisaitl and McDavid is going to be what we're watching here. And people are going to underrate Philip Dano in this situation. He has been amazing this year. I think he's going to continue in the playoffs to be just that amazing. He showed it in Montreal last year uh, when they went to the finals. I, I didn't hear enough people talking about how well he did as a shutdown center last year for Montreal, but LA obviously identified it. And now you've got maybe two of the top, say six or seven, five maybe, shutdown defense centers in the league going against the beasts of Dreisaitl and McDavid up the middle to shut that down. Um, their lower lines... I follow Lazat. Like these are not names that most people know. You're asking a lot from Quinton Byfield. You're asking a lot from a defense like Anderson, Roy, Edler, Dursey, Mata, Spence. Like most of these guys, you haven't heard all of these guys. But I'm telling you, the system that McClellan plays, every single player knows what they got to do. Every single player is giving apps perfect direction as to where the weaknesses of the opposition is for the Oilers play in the back of their net they are going to play behind the net a lot against the Edmonton Oilers because they have a lot of defensemen that are totally exposed back there Barry being one of them Keith being one of them now and you know back in the day that wasn't the case but it is now you can pressure them fast and get the puck quick and you're going to see them do that you're going to see them do that well against the Edmonton Oilers. And then it's going to be up to the forwards to be able to do something to get that puck back um, after it's gone. And uh, I think it's going to be a difficult chore. I don't think this is going to be an easy series. I'm taking, I am going to take the Oilers. But I think it's going to go six. I think LA is going to take at least two here. And mark my words. If LA wins this series, you're going to hear no surprise from me. I'm not going to be one of those people going, oh, I can't believe that the Edmonton Oilers lost to LA. I, I can believe it because LA has been playing a type of hockey all year long that screams playoff style hockey. They, they're going to, they, can, they can win 2-1, 3-2 very comfortably. And I don't see Edmonton in the same vein as that, although – down the road, Woodcroft got them playing a lot more like that, and that's why I'm leaning to Edmonton here. But I don't think this is a easy series by any stretch of the imagination. All right, that's my Western Conference, guys. Sub yourself up. I want to hear from you. I'm going to send this out to all the lands now. Tell me what you think in the comments section. Talk to you later. Have a good one. Okay, bye.